hello and welcome to your pottery making at home experience. To make this as much as possible like you're here with us in the studio, you might want to start just by getting yourself a cup of tea, put on some relaxing music, perhaps the classical playlist that we've sent you, and get yourself ready. There's four key things we've got to think about today. Number one, patience. So when you're making with clay, one of the wonderful things about it is that it forces you to take a break. It forces you to kind of walk away from a bit, give it a chance to firm up, steady into its new shape. But you have to listen to it. So when it's starting to go a bit floppy, or even if it's you who's starting to get a bit frustrated, just walk away, have a cup of tea, go for a walk around the block or anything like that, and just get yourself kind of back in the right place and let your clay get back in the right place again. Number two is drying out. So as you're working with your clay today, it is going to dry as you go, especially if you've kind of got a bit of clay in your hands, you're rolling it around, you're fiddling with it. Perhaps it takes you 10 minutes to get the shape that you want it to be. In that time, it's probably going to have dried out a bit too much to be usable. So it might be that you pop that onto the side and then remodel one based on that. But just bear in mind, your hands are warm when the clay is in your hands and it will dry out. The other thing as well is that probably in the time that it's taken for you to start this video, you'll have some clay in your hands and you'll be starting to fold it, you'll be kind of rolling it around, fiddling with it like it's blue tack. When you're folding over clay in your hands, if you imagine every time you fold it, you're kind of making a little envelope and trapping air inside of it. When that goes through the kiln, the air's got nowhere to go. And as it heats up, that air starts to expand and it's bigger and bigger and bigger. And it can sometimes cause bits to ping off in the kiln. Point number four is working on top of your cloth. So in your kit, we'll have given you a tea towel, which is super important that you work on top of it because if you're working on your tea towel, it'll just lift up because it doesn't get stuck to the surface. Whereas if you start working on your dining room table or your desk, you'll see that when you press the clay down, then you have to try and peel it up and it starts to get stuck and you'll lose whatever it was you were making. Now that you've got your basic clay information, uh, we can start thinking about what you're actually going to make. We've made a big Pinterest board, which has got loads of different things. I'm going to base this demonstration today around making a plant pot, just because once you know how to make a vessel, you can start shaping the vessel, you can make a little lid for that vessel, all of a sudden your plant pot's now a tea jar. When you're looking at the Pinterest board, bear in mind that not everything you see on there is going to be possible for you today. They might be using different techniques, different clays to what you're using. That being said, be adventurous, have a really nice time. If it's a plant pot, does it need to have holes in the bottom for drainage? Does it need little feet so that it can get air under the pot? How big does it need to be to hold the plant that it's going to be holding? Think about the function of this piece. If it's a plant pot, does it need to have holes in the bottom for drainage? Does it need little feet so that it can get air under the pot? How big does it need to be? Is it going to be a hanging planter so it needs to have three carefully placed holes to get to balance right so you can string it from the ceiling? All these things are going to be super important. People always want to make a diplodocus. They always want that long head on one side, the big tail extending on the other side. And those are things which aren't really practical for what we're doing today. Basically because if I've got a big snake of clay leaving off on this side, there's nothing to support it at all. So it's going to probably be very difficult to make to begin with. And also it's most likely going to snap off when you have to return it to the studio. Just think about making your shapes quite confined. Once you've got an idea of the thing you want to make, you've got all your inspiration together, you've picked your favourite ideas off Pinterest, you can then start kind of sketching and drawing and working out what this hybrid of all your ideas is going to become. And when you're drawing, don't worry about it. Don't think, oh, it's made GCSE art or whatever. No one's going to care what this picture looks like. It's purely a way of you getting that out in your head and working out where the ears attach on or where the kind of whatever's happening happens. So for example, if I'm going for this guy here, you can see at the bottom he's got a tiny little face. So you'll kind of pan out the shape of your pot. I'm going to draw this upside down as well. Um, he has got some tiny little feet on the bottom. So I know that he's got three feet, ones at the back. He's got a nose coming down from the top, a smiley face eyes and then I've gone mad on the top and the bottom with all the pattern work but because I'm not really going to be considering that too much at the moment it's more just knowing where these patterns are going to go what might it look like in the end. Initially when I planned this as well I had big kind of curly coily bits on the top that I thought it might have the kind of advanced version had little ears on the side of it and you can see that's by no means the most 
beautiful drawing you've ever seen, but you know by looking at that, oh, it's gonna be a plant pot with a face on. And that's really all you need to know. Just give you kind of an idea about what it might become. The final thing to think about when you're talking about your designs and your planning is do you need a template? So do you need to get your old cereal packets out and draw out all the bits that you're gonna cut out? Even if it's just for the size of the base and then working out how big it needs to be around the outside, it can be really helpful to say if you kind of roll out your clay and then cut and be like, oh, it's two centimetres too small. So plan and practice. There's two different ways you can go about making your vessel today. So you can either choose to make it with a slab of clay, as it suggests, a flat sheet, or you can use coils. Now there's advantages and disadvantages to both of these methods. You can also mix them together as well. Slabs are really good if you want something with nice straight sides. It's probably never going to be like the kind of perfect pottery that you choose to paint from the shop because that's been made in a mould, someone spent ages and ages and ages smoothing that down. Whereas this is going to be made by your hands, so even when you do choose the slab method it is still going to be a bit lumpy bumpy but embrace it, it's part of the charm. Slabs work for tea jars really well, lovely straight sides, you'll see from up the top it's kind of got that nice smooth profile to it and it does make it a bit easy for getting things to line up. You can use slabs to do something a bit more kind of ad hoc because we've got these gorgeous examples of faces where when you start to add quite a lot on, you start to add noses, it stops to be quite so uniform and a bit more character to it. Using coiling is really good if you're looking for something that's a bit curvy, you'll want to make something nice and rounded, that's going to be the technique for you. It also gives you a chance to make the most of all the marks and the lumps and the bumps that happen. So uh, one of our lovely customers at our tea jar workshop made this gorgeous pineapple jar and you can see that by using the coils it's got these natural ridges in which works so well with the pineapple texture. You can also combine techniques as well so I might decide that I want a pot that's mostly straight but then perhaps has a little curve over at the top so perhaps I use slabs all the way up, a few coils tapering in at the top and I start to build the shapes that I want to. If you've decided that slabs are the right method for you, it takes a little bit of preparation. So we'll start by getting the slabs kind of cut out, rolled out, and then we've got to leave them to dry a little bit so they're firm up enough to be able to hold the shape that you're going to model them into. So you're going to start by taking your block of clay, stand it upright, cheese wire, and we're going to chop about an inch thickness of clay all the way down. Cheese wire on the surface, push it through, hold it nice and taut. You see I'm just guiding it through. It's a bit wibbly wobbly, but it'll be all right. Pop it down. And we're going to start by rolling out that section first. So I tend to kind of give it a bit of a bash, remembering the shape that you're going to make it into. So if your template's quite long and narrow, bash it out this way. If you want it to be something a bit wider, bash it sideways. So once it's a bit thinner, we can then go on to using your rolling pin to flatten it out a bit more. Now, when you're rolling, make sure your towel is really nice and flat, otherwise you're gonna end up with quite deep creases in the bottom of the clay where it kind of twicks into it. You're also gonna roll really lightly. So it's just kind of putting on enough pressure so it starts to change the shape of it a bit, but not so hard that you're gonna create a massive dent in it because you will just obliterate it. You especially want to be careful when you get close to the edges because it's much easier to roll there than it is in the center. So when you're rolling, really focus on getting this as flat and even as you can. And if it starts to tug a bit too much on your fabric, you can always pick it up, flip it over, and again, make sure that tea towel doesn't tuck up in the bottom of it. So once it's down, pull it nice and taut underneath and then carry on with your rolling. You're going to be trying to make it so that your clay is about the thickness of a finger um, or if you've, got, if you've got a very small finger you can estimate kind of a pencil and a half just bigger than the thickness of a pencil when you're rolling. If you go too thin you'll find that when you start making with it it's just a bit too delicate. Now this tea jar I made the lid a bit a bit too thin and when I'm using it it just feels a bit too like I might break it so it's always best to leave it a tiny bit thick than to take it too thin. So because I want mine to be a little bit wider, I'm now gonna start really lightly rolling it out diagonally to kind of push it out a little bit towards the edges. You'll notice my movements are really light, quite quick rolls. 
don't worry about any marks that your roll and pin's making as well, you're going to manhandle this so much that you won't see any of them afterwards anyway. So now that my slab of clay is about the right size for the main strip of my template, I'm going to cut that out, put it to one side, leave it to dry and then I'll focus on getting a separate bit out for the base. When you cut in, Bear in mind, despite the fact that it's a clay knife, it is really sharp, um, especially the tip of it, so don't run your fingers up the side of it the same as you would with a cooking knife. Rest your template lightly on top. You're then going to use your clay knife just to cut it out. These bits off to one side. I would, it's probably a good time to say that you don't want to be working on your really high polished table because even though you're working on top of a tea towel, you might still kind of scratch it a bit, so it's best to work on something that you don't really mind that much. Or you could always put, um, again, a bit of cardboard under or something just to protect the table a little bit. You don't need to be pressing that hard when you're cutting, because the clay is so soft that your knife will just glide through without too much pressure. So that's the body of my pot rolled out. I'm going to lift it up up there lie it down to one side trying quite hard just to support it and not let it stretch or squeeze it in anywhere as I'm holding it. The base is a much easier thing to cut out because it's much smaller so all we're going to do is going to chop off a bit of clay. You want to be able to make a ball out of this that's somewhere between the size of a golf ball and a plum. Give it a bit of a whack to flatten it down. Once it's a bit flat, again pull your tea towel taut. It's going to be a light roll one way a bit too towel flat and then keep it going a bit. To cut your template out it's exactly the same process as before, lie your template lightly on top, hold it in one place and use your knife just to cut around it. These two are going to need to firm up a bit now. Because it's a curved pot I still want to keep these walls quite soft so perhaps they might sit in the sun for 20 minutes, maybe flip them over halfway through. You don't want to let them dry out too much, but equally they need to be firm enough so that when you lift up this slab, it kind of feels like it holds its shape a little bit. Uh, if you touch it at the moment, you'll see it's completely floppy and every kind of touch you make does impact the shape of it. If you're making something like a square tea jar, you might want to leave it to be a little bit firmer. So I've left my slab for about half an hour, which has given me a chance to dry out a little bit. When you're joining clay together, you want to cross hatch all the surfaces that are going to be linking um, and what cross hatching does is it kind of puts little scores in the surface of the clay breaks up to each side and then when you put some slimy clay in between it sucks those two different points together as it dries so you can imagine it's kind of locking them together i'm going to use my clay knife here i'm going to use it sideways so i get kind of a flat edge doing the cutting rather than going for the really sharp fine side because this process is more about kind of mashing up the very top surface than it is about um, like doing any deep cuts or anything like that. So you can see I've gone all the way around once and then I'm going to go around the other direction uh, turning it into little kisses so it goes across so every mark there becomes a little, well quite a rough X. So that's what we call the cross hatching. From here you're going to take some of your slimy clay which is just clay mashed in with some water. You're going to spread that across the surface. And you want, when I think about doing this, I think about toddlers eating dairy donkers, just kind of like scooping and spreading rather than actually trying to paint it in. So I'm all the way around nice and thick. So I'm going to do the same cross hatching technique along the base of this slab where that's going to join and sit on top of the bottom section. Just going to whiz along all the way in one direction, being really careful not actually to cut into the snap. So again, that's on there quite thick. And what we're aiming for is that when we sit this on top of the base, you want to hear kind of like a sound as all the clay oozes out on either side and the excess is coming out. I'm going to line it up so it sits roughly on top of the base. And you definitely want it to be sitting on top of it rather than down the sides. And then I'm just going to use my knife and trim off any excess. But when I'm doing that, you'll see that I've left about kind of again about a finger's thickness of clay, so I can get a proper overlap with it. You don't want it so that your ends are meeting kind of butt to butt. 
because then this gap here becomes a weakness because that ends up as a thin bit, whereas if you overlap them, you get a nice thick solid join. Now again, because we're joining here, we're going to whiz up dead lightly up the surface. So that's everything linked together. From here, it's going to be about really strengthening those bonds and mashing the two surfaces together so that they definitely become one rather than just two bits of clay that are sitting next to each other. And to do that, we're going to go around on the surface and again, cross that chain. You'll be well used to it by now, all the way around. Looking a bit like kind of cross stitch across the join. From here, I'm just going to support my pot from the inside blend over those kisses until it starts to look like you can't actually see the joint anymore. With the seam on the front here, it's up to you how you blend it in. I'm a really big fan of Maker's Mark, so I love it when you can see where the clay overlaps and I quite often will make a feature of it. But if you prefer, you can kind of, again, do the cross hatch, try and blend it in and get it really nice and smooth. It depends on your design completely. But for me, I'm just going to support this from the inside. Press, 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 press. That's a really lovely character there. You should find that when you put this clay together, you do hear that kind of oozing and visibly see the uh, slimy clay squeezing out from the gap. So you should have seen that when you put the top on and also when you give this a light squeeze together to make sure it's joined. You'll notice some of the joins aren't quite perfect, especially on the inside. That really doesn't matter at all because you can go back and finish them off later if you want to. It's more just about it being linked together so it feels like one solid structure. So the same principles apply no matter what you're making with slabs. So whether you're making a triangle pot, a square pot, anything like that, when you're joining those slabs together, make sure you're scoring, make sure you're slurrying, make sure you're kind of giving it that little press just to make sure it really does feel like it is joined together otherwise when it dries those seams can become weaknesses and it might be that your pot completely pops apart. When you're building with coils it's a slightly different principle because this pot is going to grow and change as you build it and it gets bigger. So you want to start with a template for the base to know roughly where the bottom is going to start and it can be quite helpful as well to make a rough kind of cross section template so you can work out how the shape's going to go and keep checking in with your pot to make sure it's going the way it's meant to be otherwise you'll get halfway up it and you'll realize instead of making a pineapple pot like you thought you were going to make you've actually made a bowl that's just got wider and wider as you've gone on with it the base is going to be the same principle as we did for making a slab base which is taking off a section of clay rolling it into a bowl flattening it down rolling it out with your rolling pin and then cut out the kind of starting point for it. Once you've got your base done, we're then going to start preparing the coils to make a pot with. I'd say it's best to make a few coils, maybe make 10 or so, so that you can start adding them and have like a nice fluid flow to your work uh, rather than kind of add one, roll, add one, roll. It just makes it a bit more kind of a pleasant process and also helps you to guide that shape a bit better because you're focused on shaping rather than jumping between two tasks. So for rolling coils, you're going to use a cheese wire to take up a small section of clay. And that's a bouncy ball shape, definitely not as big as a golf ball. Pat it nice and round in your hands and then just give it a little roll to start making kind of a thick sausage. That. You're then going to use it on your tea towel surface. And you're just going to really lightly start to roll backwards and forwards. And when I say really lightly, I mean really lightly, because if you press too hard, you're gonna end up with finger grooves in it, and also it'll instantly kind of become a rectangle that's slapping backwards and forwards. So it's really light, focusing on keeping it into that nice round coil. So if it feels like it is becoming a bit kind of rectangular, just put it on the top and kind of ease it back into a round cylindrical form. And once it starts to come out a little bit, you'll notice I'm starting to spread my fingers as I'm rolling here. And as I'm spreading that's encouraging the clay to grow longer. And as soon as I can get two hands on it, it's the same process, really lightly rolling, spreading my fingers as they're going backwards and forwards. Clay the jazz hands. See slowly it starts to grow. Now, when you're making your coils, again leave them about finger thickness. 
because that gives you a chance to kind of blend them in whereas if you're making very tiny coils these walls are going to end up so delicate to attach your first coil you're going to use a little bit of slip and that's just going to add a little bit of moisture to either surface and again help those two sections to draw together but this is the only time that you'll really need to use slip when you're coiling and it goes I'm going to lie this on top and where that meets on the end I'm just going to rest it on top give it a gentle press to make sure it's attached and that's the same as I did when I was doing the slabs you're just going to go around and try and blend these two sections together now I tend to use one finger and pull upwards all the way to blend the clay in you'll see as I'm doing that I get these kind of little ridges forming all the way around don't worry about that it's all part of your process and you'll, you won't see it afterwards it's more important to make sure you're kind of tucking that bottom section into the first coil this is going to be your most important join in the whole thing this is the one that makes this a pot rather than a giant bangle with a separate bottom to it when it falls up yeah. you want to really focus on this join because it's the most important one in the whole pot so if the bottom falls off you haven't got a very good vessel going on Then where we come to these two ends of the coil meeting, just going to try and blend it together. Now if your coil was a bit long, uh, you can just use finger and thumb just to pinch it off, just pop the rest of it to the side. With the base coil as well, I'll blend it on the inside and I'll do that now so that I can do it really thoroughly rather than trying to reach down a big long pot to be able to do it. It's the same process, but this time I'm going to be pushing the coil downwards to meet the base. And I'm going to get on with rolling a load of coils so that eventually I'll just be able to kind of add them on nice and quick. Now that I've prepared my coils, I'm going to ready to start building my pot. So the first thing to do is just lie your coil on top of here. Where it overlaps, just use your finger and thumb to pinch it off so that those ends are going to meet, sit them on top like that. Now when you put new coils on you need to be really aware and watching for where they're going to sit. So if you have one coil and your next coil sits slightly further out, that's going to make your pot start to go outwards. Whereas if you put your next coil slightly further in, it's going to help to taper your pot inwards. The way which you blend your coils as well is going to be really important. One thing we found in classes is that when people try and blend coils together, they do tend to squeeze them. And when you squeeze a coil, it gets longer and longer and longer, which in turn means your pot will get wider and wider. So if you are finding that your pot's going out when you don't mean it to, it's probably because you're squeezing it as you're joining it, rather than just kind of using a finger and thumb to blend the surface of it. So I'm going to add a few coils on, get a bit of height to it. And then once it started to come upwards, then I'll start thinking about blending them all in together. When you're adding your coils on, I try and make sure I alternate where the coils meet so there's not always kind of a seam of coils in one place because I feel like that might become a bit of a weakness in your pot. There we go. So we've got a little bit of height going on. From here, I'm going to put my hand on the inside, support the pot, and just start to blend these coils together. And you can take your time and work all the way around really methodically if you want to, but I'm just going to do the front of it just to show you how it, how it joins. You'll be end blending upwards and downwards just so we can't see where those coils were. If you keep putting your coils straight on top of each other, that's how you're going to make that straight shape. Um, but to taper them inwards, what you'll do is you'll start to inset them ever so slightly as they come in. You see that instantly starts to give us that curved shape. It's just the same process for blending, but from this time I'm going to kind of hook my fingers so they're supporting it so I don't squish it as I do it. So supporting it, blend, blend, blend. And then from here, if I wanted to, I could always start going straight up to make some sort of a 
bottleneck form if I want to. If you found by this point that perhaps your vessel has started to kind of stray outwards a little bit, you can do some quite drastic surgery. So if you've got a big ball, cut out a triangle of it as if you were doing um, a dart on a dress, get rid of that extra triangle of clay and then overlap it and join it back together. And what that's going to do is it's going to draw your vessel back in again. Once you've managed to achieve somewhere close to the shape that you were aiming for, I would probably leave it for a bit again, go have another cup of tea, get some biscuits, um, and then when you come back, it'll be a little bit firmer and ready for you to really start smoothing out that surface. We're going to touch on surface design because this is exactly the same no matter whether you choose to build with coils or whether you choose to build with slabs. Now, the first and most basic principle of surface design is textures. So when you're using slabs and you roll it out on your tea towel, you'll find that one side of it takes on the texture of the tea towel, that really nice kind of fabricy, linen-y texture. The other side of it will be much smoother and might even have a bit of wood frame from your rolling pin. You'll also have the marks which are made from when you're using your fingers on the clay. So you'll have all of your fingerprints from where you've pressed it together, where you've blended different sections. Now all of these things will occur naturally but you can choose to exaggerate them. So if I love the linen texture, I could go one step further and look around the house for perhaps a really heavy textured piece of fabric, a piece of lace. Um, you could find some leaves out the garden and roll them very lightly into it. Everything like that will start to enhance the way you're making. You can also start adding texture with things you find around the house. So one of my favourite tools to use um, is my dad's uh, ratchet set um, but you can start to press these into the clay so there's little hexagonal ones the classic kind of Phillips head ones that make really nice little kisses you can press into the clay as well so have a look around for stuff like that um, I've also got loads of kind of modeling tools from icing sets uh, pens the end of pencils are fantastic because again they're kind of these lovely geometric shapes that you can use if you want to take your surface design one step further and start building up kind of a more 3D element to the surface, uh, you can add extra bits of clay on. Now when I'm doing this, I tend to roll out the clay a little bit thinner, because if you imagine if you're adding on quite thick clay, your pot can get quite chunky. What I tend to do for adding clay on is I'll tend to sketch out on the surface first the rough shape that I'm thinking to see how it'll fit on, and then after that I'll cut it out into the bit of clay. Now, if you've sketched it on, you think that's not right at all, you can always just blend the clay back in again. To attach the bit on, I'm gonna use a little bit of the slime stuff, uh, spread it around on the surface until it starts to feel a little bit sticky. And then I'll rest my bit on top, working from the center to make sure the middle of it's attached first. I'll tap my finger around in circles to make sure there's not any air trapped under there. So that works really well for labels on jars, but it would work just as well if you were adding kind of vine leaves working around it. You could roll out some little coils for the vines and then maybe hand model some little petals and things. Just be kind of logical when you're thinking about adding things on. If it's getting stuck on, use some sticky stuff. Try not to make things too delicate. One thing that can be really good to do before you start adding on lots of different bits of clay is just to put rough marks where you're going to add them on and that helps you to balance out the design of you can also add extra bits of clay on, on top of your pot. So with this one, they've done it to add a little tail and ears onto the box. When you're doing this, use the full thickness of clay and make sure it overlaps. And I quite like to add a little bit of extra clay at the back to blend the two surfaces together because you really want to make sure these tiny details are really well attached to your pots. If you do find that when you're making your pot starts to get a little bit too dry, you can always just spritz it with a little bit of water. Or if you don't have a spray to hand, you can just kind of tip your hand in the water flick some water at it. Uh, you can also dip your finger in some water and use it to rub it on the surface and that'll start to blend in any cracks that might be forming when you're made. Thank you so much for choosing a pottery experience making kit. Uh, I really really hope you enjoy it. Um, if you've got any questions while you're going drop us an email or a message on Instagram and we'll do our best to give you a hand. As well if you do take any pictures please tag us in them please send them to all your friends because uh, we really really want to keep doing these kits for a really long time. Um, and it's you that can help us do it. So thank you and see you soon.